American pastime, baseball, brings out the All-American Girl Baseball League for spring training at Alexandria, Virginia. Two teams are working out, the Fort Wayne Daisies and the Racine Bells, getting in shape for an opening day doubleheader. Dottie Schroeder is quite confident that her hair won't get in her eyes. And keeping her eye on the ball is catcher Kate Von Dro. Okay, gals, play ball. Pat Scott has quite a curve, but this one is wide, and Gene Marlowe is willing to wait. Gene bunts it, the squeeze is on. Tibby Eisen slides home with a run and a nicely bruised leg. Better a bruise than long pants, eh, gals? Joe Weaver hits the long ball, almost out of the ballpark. Boy, that clears the base paths. And inside the park, Homer, by a whisker. Hi, everyone. This is Bob Souza from Channel 9, SATV, deep in the heart of Somerset Village. My guest today from the Racine Bells, soft, uh, all American girls professional baseball team, which you just saw in spring training in Alexandria, Virginia, against the Fort Wayne Daisies. B. Arbor Parrott, who was a member of the Bells in 1947. B, great to have you with us in studio today. Thank you. I know that your heart is still back there in 1947. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be a member of the Racine Bells and how it all came about? It was, it was a nice, easy way to earn a living. We had a lot of fun. But when you're on the, on the team, when you're on the, on the field, it was all serious. There was no fooling around or anything like that. But after the game, it, we all went out together because it was all floodlight games, and we would have a big meal after the game because you can't eat a lot if you're going to play ball. So we'd have only a snack before the game. And then uh, all the girls uh, were very friendly and very helpful, and uh, there was no... Uh, there was no problems at all as far as getting along with all of them. And uh, we stayed at people's houses, and uh, I was with Jet Vincent, who came from Fall River. She was my roommate. And we stayed at Gladys and Miles Sorensen's house. And uh, what it, it cost $5 a week, whether you were there or whether you were on the road. And for an extra dollar, she would wash our clothes and iron them. So that was a, a dollar well spent. Wash and iron for one dollar? Can't beat that. A dollar a week. Wow. <laughs> so that was pretty good. And we traveled on buses, like a Greyhound bus, but it wasn't Greyhound, it was another one. And uh, after the game, sometimes we'd just have a shower and we'd have to go, or sometimes we'd just start the next morning and go. But you didn't get to bed till about uh, almost midnight but, uh, because uh, the game went on and, and then you had to go out and have something to eat. Basically, what time did your game start? Uh, just before dark. It was all floodlight games. Floodlight games, so yeah. probably in the between 7, 7.30. About that, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. terrific. Yeah. Now, the president of your league, a Hall of Famer in 1961, played 29 years in the majors, that would be the great Max Carey, right. Pittsburgh Pirate and Brooklyn Dodger outfielder. Yeah. Could you tell us a few things about Max Carey? Well, the only thing I know, I never met him because he was in Chicago, I think, all the time. But I know that uh, he was, he was, they said that he was the only man that ever hit a, 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 a triple play in a World Series. Now, whether that was right or not, I don't know, but that's what they said. He got a, 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 a triple out. In, in, uh, one, in one World Series. And he had an office, because he was uh, in the Wrigley Building in Chicago. And this Sophie Currys, who was on a, a Racing Bells, she used, to, she used to hit the ball and get on first and steal second every time. And she was only getting regular pay. And she, she, came, she came from, I think it was Flint, Michigan. And she went to Chicago one time, and, and she went in, right into Max Carey's office, and she told him she wanted more money. And she, 
she talked to him and she says, well, look, I break all these records and I'm an all-star and I'm only getting whatever it was at the time. She ended up with $110 a week. Wow, <laughs> doubled her salary. Yeah. That's terrific. Now, Max Carey played for Pittsburgh and uh, later with the Brooklyn Dodgers, was a switch hitting outfielder, played center fielder. Center field was a great defensive player. He was one of 11 guys in Major League history to have an unassisted triple play. However, not in the World Series, but one of your managers in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League is the person, the only person, to have an unassisted triple play in the World Series, and that was Billy Wamsgantz, Wambi, oh, yeah. who was a second baseman for the Cleveland Indians. And in 1920, uh, against the Brooklyn Dodgers in the World Series, Game 5, for some reason the Brooklyn manager put the hit and run on with runners on first and second, and the pitcher batting. Clarence Mitchell was a good hitting pitcher, hit a vicious line drive towards second base. So Wamsgant, second baseman, was on the move to cover, caught the line drive, stepped on second, tagged the runner coming from first, and executed the only triple play in World Series history. That was the amazing part. Now, I was going to mention Philip Wrigley, owner of the Chicago Cubs, was the founder of the uh, all-American Girls Professional Baseball League. He did that because of the scarcity of men playing not only in the majors during World War II, but also in the minors. So he thought this would be a great idea, hence the league uh, was established. So you had a very competitive league. And tell us about the transportation that you provided for Alice de Cambra to get to that league, a fascinating story. Well, Alice de Cambra and I were friends because we played uh, at the St. Patrick's Skills in Somerset. And she came down one time and she said, uh, you know, why, why don't we, we know, well, they're gonna try out for professional baseball for girls. And I said, no, they don't play. She said, yeah, 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 you'll get paid for it and everything. She says, they have a tryout in Mississippi. So I says, no, you're kidding. She, no, she says, yeah, it was, in it was in today's paper. This was a sa uh, Sunday. So she says, yeah, it's in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Well, she had a kind of a junky car, and mine was a little bit less junky. So I said to her, well, you, I can't try out because I'm going to Canada this year, and my aunts are expecting us and everything, and my sister and niece are all going with me. So I says, but I can drive, we can drive down together, and you can try it out. And if you make it, you can go with the girls, and if you don't make it, we'll both come back together. So she says, well, if I make it, you're gonna come back by yourself? I says, yeah. So she says, well, okay. So we got the car and we brought food with us so we wouldn't have to pay anything on the way down. We had a ham and some chicken pots and stuff like that. And uh, we went down and we started, we stopped in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And it was just a little place, and they had uh, tryouts. Well, the girls were staying, all the other girls that were trying out were, were staying in an old army camp that was empty. So they had like motels in there. So we went to the, the game, and there was a whole lot of girls playing, and they were doing all these exercises and everything. And I was sitting in the grandstand, and she, came lunchtime, somebody brought lunches to the girls, so Alice said, I'll sneak you a sandwich so, so that you won't have to go to a restaurant because we didn't have much money. So I said, okay. So she snuck me a restaurant, a, a sandwich, and uh, while they had a little rest, and then they were playing again. And one of the coaches said, why don't you try out? Because I had my, my glove with me because we used to play catch in the side. And I said, well, I can't because I've got a previous commitment. I'm going to Canada. So he said, well, it's too bad. I said, well, that's where it goes. You know, you can't do everything. So she made it, and uh, then she went. She went with the other girls, and and, uh, and I I came home, and uh, we she used to write to me and everything. And she she played with Fort Wayne when she first went. She did make the Fort Wayne Daisy team. Yes, and she played with the Fort Wayne Daisies. And after she'd been there 
uh, maybe two years, she, she came home for the, for the winter, and then she went back. And then one day uh, I, said to, I said to her sister Lil and uh, uh, Virginia Benavides and Helen de Cambra and Charlotte Benavides, and I said, do you want to go out to Fort Wayne and visit Alice? So they said, they said, yeah. So I said, well, if we all go together, we'll chip in for gas and it won't cost too much and uh, we'll just see how she's making out. So that's what we did, <laughs> the five of us. And uh, the girls, I had a hundred dollars. That was my, I was the richest one there. I had a hundred dollars. And the, uh, the other girls went to the credit union and of course they knew Oliver Perry anyway. Wow, and, there's uh, a name out of the past. Yeah, and, and uh, he gave them a loan, I think it was $75, but then they had to give them the first $5 back or something like that because they didn't have much money at all. Right. So we went out, we had a very good time because everything was, well, we were all young, you know, and having a good time. And we'd stay at a motel and we'd always have to pick a, hot, a, a motel that, that had enough room for five of us, a cot and all that stuff, you know, and uh, then, we, we brought food with us too for the first few days. And uh, then when, when we get out there, I think we, I, we must have stayed in a hotel somewhere. I don't remember a motel somewhere. I don't remember that. But, but uh, then we had a good time anyway. And when we came back, um, there was a, a fried chicken place on Route 6. In those days, you know, there was no super, super highways. You had to go Route 6 that way. and. Uh, with, there was a, a chicken in a basket place. Topsy's chicken in the basket. Whatever, yeah. yeah. So we said so we pooled our money together, and if we put what, all the money we had left over, if we put it in, we could all we could get a chicken in a basket because by then we were pretty hungry. Wow, that's an amazing story. <laughs> we had such a good trip. <laughs> well, you, you our know. two technicians, Laurie and Jessica, are going to run a few slides of some of the events that took place in your lifetime. Here we have the uh, Racine Bells working out. Racine, Wisconsin, there's a double play around the infield. Now here's the, the delivery. And a, this is just a quick film. This is batting practice and fielding practice pregame. There's the manager. That looks like Billy Wamsgantz right there as he's hitting infield practice. This is an old black and white film. Now they're running the bases. Today this would be likened to wind sprints. This is classic footage from the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Here we go with the Fitch card. This is B. Arbor. This is what you look like, 1947. It says a native of Massachusetts, B played for just one season in 1947 with the Racine Bells. As she saw her action in less than 10 games, no official stats were kept. Married for 42 years, the ex sure handed shortstop enjoys traveling and gardening. Well, this card came out, I believe, in 1995, because you were married 57 years yeah. to Don Parrott. So this card was a little early. Here's the official contract that you signed with the league. This is your contract. And uh, Somerset Center, Massachusetts. Your home was down on Riverside Avenue where the cannons are yeah. today. And let's see, $55 per week. <laughs> 55 whereas around here, if they made $20 a week, that was huge. Yeah. You were 55 plus five dollars a day expenses. Then of course, we have the signature, your signature on the contract. So that was it, the Uniform Players Contract, 1947, Max Carey, President. Now, could you comment on Alice de Cambra, number four, and here is Alice in the bunting pose, and her card, uh, let's see, with Fitch also, Eight years younger, uh, Nikki Leonard, born in 1928. Could you comment on these two players from Somerset? Yeah, yeah. They, we played with. They played with St. Patrick's. The St. Patrick's team. St. Patrick's girls. 
softball team here. And that was opposite Pierce's Field. The church is still there well, today. Yeah. We started at St. Patrick's uh, at, uh, we started at Pierce's, but we ended up at Pottersville Field. Okay, hold yeah. more, you could hold more people. Yeah. <laughs> right, because you people drew many fans. So Nikki was uh, uh, eight years younger. What was the deal with her when she went to restaurants and stuff? She had to be accompanied by an adult? No, what it is out there, if, if, if the restaurant serves liquor, you cannot go in even if you're not going to drink. You cannot go in unless you're 21. I see. That's the way they have it. Uh, that's the way it was then, anyway. Right. Yeah. But I don't know if you realize, when, when the girls started playing professional, it was softball. But every year they made the ball a little bit smaller. And when they finally ended up, it was baseball. Right. Yeah. And when they first started, they pitched underhand. And when I went, they could pitch either way, underhand or overhand, because the ball was still kind of, kind of is bigger than a, a baseball. But when they f finally stopped, because they, they couldn't get enough people to come, because major leaguers were out there by then. Coming back from the war. Yeah. Now the league went from started in 1943 and uh, lasted till 1954, because the minor leagues were building up again, so that would be the end of the girls. But in the film clip. I saw one of the girls throwing sidearm yeah. and one throwing underhand. Yeah. Didn't quite see any overhand pitching yet in that film. Let's see, Alice was very skilled. Yeah, and that she, she never lived long enough to realize she was going to be a, in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. Wow. That's, which is too bad because yeah, she, played, that's sad. she played for a lot of years. Right, yeah. and she was very skilled. She played a little bit of second base shortstop, outfield, and even pitch. Yep. She had the skill to pitch. And Nikki Leonard was, uh, came from the center of town, Pottersville area. She was younger. Yeah. She played with Fort Wayne Daisies also. Right. And uh, Alice, I think, ended up with Peoria, Peoria yeah, Red Yeah, she Wings. went to Kalamazoo and then Peoria, because you didn't have any say, see, that, uh, they traded you when they wanted to and they put you wherever they wanted you to be to try to make it uh, more even so there'd be more competition, I think. Good, more so balanced could, league. And, and that's why Alice was uh, moved around. I see, and to they, strengthen other teams. And, and they moved around because sometimes they couldn't draw enough crowds so they tried another city. And, and it's because these were small cities, you right. know, not big. And uh, they'd go, They'd go. They'd knock off uh, one t one place and put it in, in another place. Instead. Right. That's why we had the Kalamazoo, Muskegon, right, uh, Milwaukee. Right. All teams called the Chicks for different reasons. They changed uh, yeah. uh, franchises. Now let's see if we what else we have on the board. Laurie and Jessica are doing a terrific job. Oh, here we go. This is just prior to your going to the uh, All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. You were a very uh, close uh, friend of many of the Boston Red Sox. This would be 1940, 41, 42. You worked Sears Company in Boston, right? Right. Right, right near Fenway. This is the great Babe Ruth visiting Fenway Park, 1942. And there was a picture Recently, uh, with Ted Williams, he's not with Ted here, but the picture sold for $100,000 at an auction just <laughs> recently. So, Babe, they got Babe to pose for you. And there's the great one, Joe DiMaggio. You were very friendly with Dominic, the middle brother, the youngest brother in the DiMaggio family. Joe came in in 42. So those are great pictures from your album <laughs> that you possess. And if you were to put those on auction, you would be a millionaire today. <laughs> but they mean more than money to you. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if, I, if I ever saw those things, my, uh, my granddaughter's husband would, would kill me, I think, because he's crazy over sports. <laughs> well, this is worth more than money. This is a memory lane. Yeah. Now we have uh, major league players who became your friends. Player manager, Joe Cronin. This is probably 1941. This was a pretty good year for the Red Sox. 
This is you with your camera, and I don't know the other two. Those are the two girls that I met at a ball game, and they knew all the ball players and in their street clothes. And that's how come I moved to Boston, because they knew so much about baseball. Boston. And, and uh, I figured, well, maybe I could get a job in Boston. So I lived in Boston for until war broke out, like a year and a quarter after. Here's a young Johnny Pesky who had come up in 1941, 42, as a rookie looking up and posing for you. Johnny was just uh, honored at Fenway Park for the 100th year celebration last week. So Johnny is about, uh, he was born in 1919, so that puts him uh, maybe 90, 92. 92. He's about one year older than you. Yeah. Okay, here we have a picture of a close friend of yours at the time, B, Ted Williams, who's age 22, giving you a hug here. You're age 20. Ted became a close friend of yours. The other picture he writes, 2B, best wishes to one of my favorites. And of course, it's signed Ted. And if you <coughs> remember, a great year for him, 1941, the last player ever to do what? Bat? 406. 406, 400. And your friend Joe Cronin later on pointed out he actually batted with today's rules 420 because in 41 he hit 14 sacrifice flies in which a runner tagged up on third base and scored after the out. Today that scored as a time at bat, right. uh, no, no time at bat yeah. rather, then it was a time at bat without a hit so that he lost credit in today's world you would have a sacrifice fly no time at bat. Yeah. He did that 14 times in 1941. Yeah. The last time that's been done. Okay, in uh, the year 2011, the Somerset High School Athletic Hall of Fame inducted B. Arbor as one of the most outstanding athletes ever in the history of the school. A 1938 graduate of Somerset High School she was one of the few professional athletes to make it. We all know about uh, Jerry Remy, class of 1970, uh, Greg Gagne, class of 1979. But going back long before that, in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League was the one and only Beatrice Arbor from the class of 1938. And Hopefully, we're going to get a look, B. This will be a surprise. B. Arbor was a student at Somerset. There were no girl sports. There were only three boy sports, and then the boy sports were only a few years old. And she and a couple of her friends went to the student council and said, if the boys can have a basketball team and a baseball team and a football team, then why can't the girls at least have a basketball team? So. With B. Arbor being one of the uh, people behind that, uh, that's how girls sports at any level started at the high school in uh, 1937 and 38. People will say, you know, you hear about Jerry Remy and you hear about Greg Gagne as Somerset's two major leaguers. Well, we had four women who played major league women's baseball in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League of the 1940s. We had Nikki Leonard, and Alice and Lillian DeCambra, and also B. Arbor. Uh, the changes that have happened in her lifetime um, have been spectacular with the opportunities that we now have for girls sports. And she really was at the forefront in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, pushing for something that did take a long time, but is finally here. And we are really pleased to have you finally join us in the Hall of Fame, class of 1938, B. Arbor, Okay, B, we can see you returning to your table from the podium where you've just been inducted 
into the Somerset High School Athletic Hall of Fame. Tell us what was your feeling at that moment. What went through your mind and what was in your heart at that time? A long overdue induction. Your thoughts of that evening. Well, I was surprised to be inducted in the first place because that was so long ago. And uh, everybody was, all, all the audience was very quiet all the time I was talking. I was pretty impressed because that was the first time I ever spoke in front of anybody. And I, was, I enjoyed it. You know, there is a little bit of intrigue going on in today's world with the security uh, guarding the president overseas. But you were a personal friend of a backup catcher for the Red Sox. Mo Berg spoke and read 12 different languages. And he worked for the OSS, the Organization of uh, Special Services, which would be likened to today's CIA. Mo Berg twice went to Japan with Major League All-Stars, 1932, 1934. While the team was playing Japanese All-Stars, the government was involved in a program of military aggression in Southeast Asia and in the Asian mainland. So Mo Berg didn't go to the ballpark. He went to various hotels from the rooftop. He would, with his special camera, take pictures of Japanese industries that were building bombs and really leading on the path to warfare. So as a spy for the United States government, he turned over very important information which was used by our Air Force in the bombing of Japan at the end of World War II. You knew him very well because he needed a ride to his hotel back in Boston. Could you tell our viewers that story before we say goodbye? <laughs> yes, well, I was standing out in front with the, with the two girls after the game, because that's when we used to get a lot of pictures of, of the players in their uh, street clothes, and Mo Berg came out, and because they knew us because of my dinky car. It was a, a, a convertible, a 1929 uh, Chevrolet convertible with a holes of patches on the roof. And he said, hey, how about a ride to my hotel? So I said, sure, which hotel? And he told me what it was. And I said to the girls, I don't know where that is. And they, one of them said, I do, I do. So she, they, she got in the front and the other one got in the rumble seat with Mo Berg and we, we took him to his hotel. <laughs> It was downtown in, in, in Boston. Well, I'll tell you, this has been a wonderful show uh, today because of your visit. You have enlightened us as to what the world was really like here for people in Somerset in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, all the way to the present day. And I thank you very, very much. It's been a great honor to have you in studio and to know you and to call you a personal friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Well, the pleasure was all ours. So this is Bob Souza for The Arbor Parrot saying we'll be rounding third and heading home. Thanks for watching.